Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation and chronic daily migraine survivor. I am here today with Dr. Tim Smith. Hi, Tim. How are you? Doing well, Lindsay. Thanks for having me on again. Thanks for being here. Uh, Dr. Smith is a regular guest on Heads Up. He brings us such useful and up-to-date information when it comes to talking about medications that are useful to us or up and coming related to migraine, cluster, all headache disorders. He is the CEO of Study Metrics Research. He has conducted numerous migraine research trials and he is also the vice president of the National Headache Foundation. Today we have an extremely interesting topic. It is a little bit controversial and we are gonna talk a lot about it. It is psilocybin. Psilocybin is a naturally occurring psychedelic compound produced in fungus or mushrooms. It is illegal in most areas of our country, which makes it very difficult to perform rigorous clinical trials related to migraine or other pain disorders uh, on this particular compound. However, many people have reported that the use of sub-psychoactive doses of psilocybin have improved their headache conditions, particularly cluster headache. Uh, recently, a group from Yale excuse me, published a small study looking at results of psilocybin use in a group of people with migraine. So we would like to talk about psilocybin today and this recent data. Um, but Dr. Smith, let's start with why do you think the population of people with cluster and uh, some of the people with migraine have found that sub-psychoactive doses of psilocybin helps them in preventing their attacks? Well, it's uh, pretty clear that uh, um, this comes from uh, serotonin. It, the, the, the active compounds uh, have uh, serotonergic or serotonin blocking effects, depending on which one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that these uh, so-called psychedelic uh, compounds, uh, mushroom extracts, uh, uh, the work and use of these uh, uh, products goes back 60, 70 years, uh, well before uh, they were determined to be illegal by, uh, by the federal government in most states. And uh, there was uh, a, a lot of work and clinical use uh, around uh, mental health and uh, uh, lots of other uh, uses um, back in the day. And, uh, and um, um, then uh, out of that came the headache research. And honestly, um, you know, we know serotonin uh, active compounds like uh, sumatriptan and all mm -hmm. the triptans and some of the preventive medications have everything to do with serotonin active, serotonin related activities. Right. And uh, honestly, I think uh, had we not been working with uh, some of the psychedelic compounds in the 50s, 60s, um, you know, and, and doing observational work around headache and migraine control. Uh, we, we, uh, the LSD derivatives and, and modified compounds, we probably wouldn't know nearly as much about uh, migraine control. And we might not even have some of the, you know, serotonin, uh, you know, related compounds on the market, which help uh, millions of people now. So, so there's something to it. I think uh, what we're probably going to wind up talking about later this uh, this uh, segment is that uh, is there, we just don't know what that something is some of the time, and right. and uh, it's frustrating to scientists to kind of go through this and and find sort of contradictions in some of the receptor pharmacology, but uh, the, on this backdrop of success across broad populations of patients, and that's that's where we find ourselves continually um, looking for answers. Right. So just to throw out there some of the history of what's been published and the anecdotal reports, um, I used to work in clinical research, and I think it's important that everyone understands that um, it is, it's, you, research doesn't just boom happen. You don't get the perfect study right away when something interesting pops up. You're going to get some anecdotal reports, some survey results which we have we have a survey of cluster busters where um, there is re it's reported that that psilocybin helps people with cluster a lot but it wasn't rigorous study data it's not a randomized controlled trial um, so we have like little bits and pieces of data but not any 
rigor, rigorous studies is, is really what's missing, <clears throat> excuse me, and also molecular data of understanding why is, is missing and it's, and it's hard to come by. So that's sort of the phase we're at. But just recently what we had was a very small study published where they did test psilocybin, and this was in people with migraine, not cluster. And so this is just the phase we're at in research. We just aren't at the huge study phase where we can look at why this is working and if it's for sure uh, scientifically rigorous. And um, so as I mentioned before, it's difficult to conduct these trials because it's illegal. <laughs> the, the substance itself is illegal. Um, but why there's another problem that we have when we talk about this scientifically that I was hoping you could elucidate for us. The science behind the action of psilocybin itself is a little bit confusing when it comes to pain. It has to do with the 5-HT2A receptor, correct? Can you talk to us about that? Yep. Uh, happy to talk about that. And I'll point out, you, you've mentioned the illegal status and the other thing is funding. Uh, you know, yeah. there's no, you know, sort of commercial entity that mm -hmm. uh, stands to gain from this. And so the funding has not been robust on that. So that's a drag right. also on, on uh, why we do. And that's true for a lot of natural compounds. Right. Uh, or derivatives. Uh, but the, this, uh, this uh, controversy, I don't know if it's a controversy, it's just sort of a contradiction maybe, right. um, because uh, we know that psilocybin acts at the 5-HT2A receptor, mm -hmm. and we know that 5-HT, five, five and that's a serotonin receptor subtype. Uh, people who are nerd out about uh, uh, serotonin receptors, uh, like I do, for, you know, pharmacology, uh, uh, receptor pharmacology nuts, you know, know that there are 18 different uh, serotonin receptor subtypes in the human body and they're located in different places. And depending on whether you stimulate them or inhibit them and, and on where you do it uh, and in which receptor subtype you do it with, you get different results. And mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of them in the brain that we know that they're intimately associated with things like mood control, sleep uh, control, and then also uh, not the least of which uh, migraine and other headache, uh, uh, you know, control and and uh, and that sort of thing. So, uh, the typical understanding of 5-HT2A receptors as they as they pertain to migraine, especially, is that these receptors, when stimulated, are what we call pronociceptive. That means they increase the pain signaling along that trigeminal nerve that's so important for migraine right. and migraine patients. That's the nerve that innervates the, the lining of the brain and the nerve networks along the blood vessels that course through the brain. And that's where that throbbing, blinding headache uh, that makes you sick and puts you to bed, that's where that comes from. So if you think of psilocybin st stimulates that receptor, then why on earth would that be a good thing for headache? And so, uh, you know, and, and uh, as another example of, of uh, what I'm talking about, there used to be a compound and many of your uh, cluster headache folks that have been around for a while, uh, you know, my age or so, uh, the recall of a compound called methysurgi that was marketed right. under the brand name of Sandoz. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a good cluster headache medication, a good preventive medication, also good for migraine as well. And when we look at how that compound worked, it uh, inhibited 5-HT2A receptors. Mm -hmm. So we got this little bit of a disconnect, kind of a contraindication, or uh, not a, con a, a contradiction right. on, on mechanisms. Now, I don't want to quibble with, you know, mechanisms and, and uh, you know, clinical results, because if people get better, then by all means, who cares? I mean, it's, it's uh, better is better. And uh, the other point to make on that uh, uh, is that when you take a, a, a plant or a fungus extract, uh, as we're doing here, you don't get just plain psilocybin. There are other related compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these plants are not precision uh, drug manufacturing organisms or, or, or funguses uh, and plants. Uh, you know, when we make a new drug in the lab, it's highly precision, you know, to be a very uh, kind of a smart bomb approach. I'm just going to attack a CGRP molecule, for example, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to touch anything else. And psilocybin is a 5-HT2A receptor agonist, but it also does other things. 
and then also there are other extracts from uh, uh, psychedelic mushrooms that may be related and, and, and might, uh, you know, a few molecules different one way or the other on some of these uh, compounds might make the difference between an agonist or an antagonist or something that uh, really attaches to one receptor versus the other. But it's clear that it has to do with serotonin. Uh, we, we trust that the data from the, you know, from the cluster buster survey was, uh, was uh, uh, compelling. Uh, there have been other uh, case reports and anecdotes. And uh, we know people, you know, from advocacy mm -hmm. uh, work that clearly, uh, uh, you know, benefit from, uh, from uh, you know, some, some of these compounds and extracts from, uh, from psychedelic mushrooms. And um, so it's just, we're in the process, of, and this is the way, to your point, when you start out doing clinical trials, you know, you start with small proof of concept studies, and uh, sometimes the study design on those are weak and the populations are small, and that's the case with this Yale study. Yes. Uh, but, a, but, a, but a good result is a good result. So I'd rather have a good result from a weak study than a bad result from a weak study. At least that right. keeps, uh, keeps the ball rolling and it, it serves as sort of seed corn for you know, the next phase. And, and right. what we need to do is find funding sources to get to that next phase. Right. So the, my next question, that leads into my next question. We might not exactly know. I wanted to get that point across because people who talk about this might come up against both a molecular argument, we don't fully understand why it works, right? And they, the legal argument, et cetera. But why don't you tell us about this new data from Yale that came out? Right, so what they did was, it was a small study and it's called a crossover design. So mm -hmm. they had 10 patients they studied and uh, they basically um, had an observation period to get their baseline data. And uh, then they uh, treated them with a dose of uh, psilocybin, mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, psychedelic mushroom uh, extract psilocybin, mm -hmm. and uh, then observed them doing headache diaries like we do in all migraine studies. That's how we know, you know what's going on. Right. And then uh, after two weeks, they crossed them over to, to the other side. So it was placebo controlled, mm -hmm. which is, you know, this is what we... Uh, look for yeah. in a good study is a placebo <laughs> control. Right. So, uh, uh, so patients either got the placebo or the psilocybin, and then after the two weeks of observation and headache diary, you know, data entry, then they they cross those populations over to receive the other treatment. So everybody got a dose of psilocybin and everybody got a dose of placebo. We, the order in which it was administered uh, was randomly assigned, mm -hmm. and then patients could, um, you know, could uh, show that, uh, uh, you know, we entered their diary data, and then the, the analysis was performed. And what it showed, encouragingly, is that uh, those uh, uh, patients who had received the, uh, when they received the, on the psilocybin arm, they did have a uh, about a one headache day reduction in their two week period or one day per week in their two week period. And then, and it did separate uh, statistically, it was significant in this very small population. And then the placebo arm did not, it was like a 0.15 day difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did not separate. So, you know, those are our, our great results. Again, a weak study design. There's some methodologic issues with this crossover design, and, and uh, we don't know what the proper washout period should have been between the two arms and that kind of stuff, uh, the two treatment periods. So we, uh, I don't want to debate that now. or get it's, it's sort of just we understand that it's a positive result in a weak study, and that's all we really need to know about it. The, um, the other thing that was interesting in the study was that there were – uh, patients that uh, did uh, experience some some of the psychoactive uh, symptoms from uh, the the psychedelic symptoms from uh, taking the dose, mm -hmm. and that lasted for a short period of time. But the headache benefit uh, endured for the two week period. So right. th so that kind of reinforces what we know from uh, survey data that suggests that people can get a headache benefit from a from a sub psychedelic dose. And so mm -hmm. that was congruent with what we know from, from surveys and anecdotal reports out there. So right. 
um, that and those are that's the seminal you know kind of the the big picture top line results from it and uh, so it's encouraging it's um, uh, I wouldn't say it's eye popping. It's not the mm -hmm. the big slam dunk we've been looking for, uh, but it's helpful to know, and uh, I think it will help us uh, learn how to study uh, going forward. Right. Um, what do you think is the next step for psilocybin research in regards to migraine and cluster? A, we need more funding to to pull this yeah. stuff off. That's um, that's where we start. Right. I, I think so. You know, if you if for those of our viewers and listeners out there that care about this, uh, you know, make a generous uh, donation here at the end of the year to your favorite organization that sponsors patient centric research. Mm -hmm. um, I always plug the National Headache Foundation uh, because that's my organization that I belong to. But there are others, and uh, as long as you can support that effort. Um, you know, good things can happen. It's clear that we're not going to have uh, a lot of robust results without adequate funding. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lindsay uh, pointed out that, uh, you know, the, the legality of use is, uh, is kind of a hindrance. Uh, we do have some communities and um, I think even the state of Oregon has decriminalized it. Um, uh, hopefully that'll start uh, softening a pathway towards um, a better study uh, design and, and more open uh, conduct of studies and, and more acceptance of uh, the fact that uh, there is a, a potentially a, a legitimate uh, medical benefit from this. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we could see those studies. would love to see that uh, along the way. Right. Um, so again, we will do once it is, the next step, I think, would be a larger randomized controlled trial yes. of psilocybin in both migraine and in cluster would probably be the goal. Um, so hopefully we will be able to come on and discuss that uh, at some point in the near future. Yeah. That would be very exciting. Is there yeah. anything else you'd like to add to our discussion of psilocybin and uh, headache disorders? Well, I think there's still some basic science work to be done as well. I think mm -hmm. uh, understanding these receptor effects and the right. different compounds in these extracts. And uh, we have some standardization issues, uh, you know, uh, uh, the quality of the products that are being uh, homegrown or acquired is, uh, is hard to uh, sort of adjudicate and confirm. Um, but uh, you know, there, there's a, there's just a lot of work in a lot of areas, and that's the nature of of um, using uh, naturally occurring you know products right. uh, to uh, treat longstanding you know problematic illnesses and everything. Right. But uh, we hope people will you know uh, continue to be encouraged, and if you get the opportunity to uh, fund, help fund research or participate in research, uh, get the word out about, uh, the need. I think, um, sometimes, uh, research funders don't understand, you know, how important this is, how much people, you know, uh, suffer and how bad the uh, quality of life can be for right. migraine and for, for cluster headache. And so, uh, through your efforts, Lindsay and others that do what you do to try to get the word out and, and raise awareness and help answer questions and improve understanding on that. I think that goes a long way to helping us uh, move to, to, uh, to better research and, and better outcomes. Right. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Smith. And thank you everyone for joining us for this episode, uh, episode excuse me, of Heads Up. And please join us again next week. Bye-bye.